everybody should know, I am a PowerPoint virgin. <laughs> this is the first ever times I've tried to do this. So if anything goes wrong, please bear with me. So in order to just talk about the development of the hands movement capability, I'd like to talk about how babies develop movement. Now babies start out, they, they're lying on their stomachs or on their backs, more often than their stomachs, and they can't do anything uh, except suckle. And then they start to look around, and so they begin to raise the head. So that's, there's the baby, and she's already got a little bit of support coming from the arm, but basically she's just extending. So the movement of extension is the first thing we all added to our repertoire when we were infants. Now, you extend a little more, and the arms are helping even more, and look at the, the angle of the, of the arms. The elbows are not locked straight, but they're almost straight, and there's a lovely 90 degree angle between arms and, and body. A lot of the, the babies, they're so incapable that they can't afford to learn movement in some screwed up way because it, it won't work. They have to find the, the moment of mechanical advantage, which is often some sort of a 90 degree angle between one limb and another, or one part of the torso and another part of the torso. And then the next thing that happens is that they begin to now roll. I still remember my daughter, she, she was three months old and she looked up and then plopped over <laughs> on her back. And she was as surprised as anybody. It didn't happen for another three months, but the rolling is simply a torsion of the spine that allows the body to begin to move more fluidly in space. And then, the, another thing, once you've got the arms up, then the legs are going to start pushing in order to locomote, in order to actually to, to get towards what here would be a called commando crawling. Because uh, he's crawling, but his belly is still on the ground. And notice through all this, the belly is getting all sorts of stimulation from the ground. This is very, very important part of it. It's not just learning to move the limbs. It's having actual sensory stimulation of the whole torso, the whole body, which is educating the baby to its sense of self and leading to the ability to move the limbs in this way or that. Uh, so there, and you see that now here, the hand, we're going to talk about flexion of uh, the fingertips, which is from the, the deep flexor, digitorum, or else flexion of the whole hand, which comes from different muscles, the lumbricals and the interosseous. But it, again, when the baby is learning locomotion, it, it, it gets its toes in there so that it can give more of a push. And now, so the, and now the leg is coming up underneath. Again, there's, a, there's a, a, a flexion of the leg in order to increase the crawl, but also to begin to come to, well, oh, the, it's too dark. You can't see how beautiful her, leg, her arms are, are, are placed. She's half turned already to sitting. But you see how elegant it is. She's almost, she's going backwards into sitting. And she's a, it's a roll and a curl of the leg and a support from the arms, which will eventually ring. And how long is it since any one of us sat like that? <laughs> Look at that verticality. Now, it's very, very important that he's sitting that way before he stands that way. Because if many people, uh, they try to get their kids to stand and walk really young. And, and Moshe Feldenkrais used to get very angry about that because he said, these are the, the kids that have back problems 40 years down the road. Because the spine, the bones of the spine are very soft. They're not ready to actually bear all the weight. And so now he's in a much safer position from the point of view of, of forces acting on his spine, but he's coming, he's, his apprenticeship, he's coming to stand, I mean to verticality without having the added complication of having to stand. So this all happens in the first year of a baby's life. Now, oh, what happened there? <laughs> this is the first uh, th uh, step beyond sitting. But you see, before we get to stand, the first thing she does is she sticks her tush up in the air. There's another wonderful, uh, oh my god, there's a laser thing. There's a, there's a, a 90 degree angle, you see? See that 90 degree angle? It's very, very important for, for any sort of mechanics. But skeletal mechanics is based on very, very simple laws of physics. 
And so, now all this happens for a year before anybody begins to stand or walk. But when, when finally, <laughs> they walk like this. The right. baby steps. Good job. Go. Good job. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like when you get up and walk for the first time, it's not exactly elegant or fluid. Like if they don't kill themselves, it's a miracle. Okay, so all that now, how about there's a corollary process in piano playing. Because the baby at the keyboard is a hand. And the hand, the first thing we do, the hand has to stand and walk. Right. So every kid, every kid that we bring to the piano and we start off with piano lessons, we instantly, the first thing we do is bypass a whole year's apprenticeship. Okay? So you wonder, well, why are we hurting ourselves? Why, are, why do we have tendonitis? Why do we have carpal tunnel? Well, why not? Why not? When the first thing we do is make the hand stand up, and we make it walk, we make it run, and the hand needs a developmental process just the way we all went through it as a baby. So the exercises I'm going to give you now are designed to fill that gap. Um, so you can all do them and a lot of them, the first ones are based on this idea that there's a stimulation of the entire body in crawling and rolling and there's all sorts of contact with the ground. Now would you please uh, rub this part of your fingers please, just rub the underside of your finger and now rub the palm instead. Where is there more sensitivity? How many people felt more sensitivity in the fingertip, in the finger? Oh, we've got two in the back. At three. How many people felt more sensitivity in the palm? Uh-huh, everybody else. Okay, so you three, I'll give you, I won't make you leave right away. You can try it again. <laughs> Why did everybody else say the palm? Well, there's actually, yesterday we saw a homunculus, this little funny man where there's a representation of how much brain power is, is devoted to, eat, to representing each part of the, the body. And the body is this little tiny thing, and the hands are these big, huge, giant things. And the lips are fatter than Angelina Jolie's. <laughs> <coughs> so here, there's more, there are more sensory nerves. It's richer in the palm than, than, in, the, than in the fingertip. So, so when we slide our hands on our, on our thigh, for instance, it's a very, very simple exercise. You just slide the hand back and forth, slide the hand back and forth. But try to sense how the palm and the fingertip are, are the palm and the underside of the finger are being connected. And sort of they're being educated as to how they're connected to one another. Then we can come forward and separate the thumb. This is very important because the thumb is a very special digit. And separate the thumb and Bring the thumb around one side of the knee and the fingers around the other side of the knee. We can go forward and down and all the way back. And, this, and then we can do that on the keyboard so that I might, I might first slide my hand along the keyboard very slowly so that the key, the, there's no sound made and the keys come up silently. I might do it the other way. With the, now you see I have to raise my fingertip a little bit so that it doesn't catch on the keys. So I have to raise the fingertip a little bit like that. That's like baby sticking its head up for the first time. So in piano playing, we grasp, we flex the fingers all the time, but actually in order to flex the fingers well, I, I need to be able to extend them. Every time a runner takes a step, the first thing that happens is that the leg is drawn forward. The quadriceps muscle in the leg is like extension in the fingers, and runners train their quadriceps more than they train the muscles that push the leg off. So, so we need the extensors, or every time we're playing any sort of note, we play the note, and then it, the extensors pull the finger back for the next one. So the extensors need to be woken up, and this is a nice way of doing it in a stress-free environment. Then afterwards, I might, 
I might <coughs> slide a little quicker, I might actually make noises. All this nothing to do with, with playing the piano, nothing to do with music, and yet everything to do with waking the hand up and uh, awakening the hand to its own possibilities and its own sense of self at the sensory level. I can, I can bring the thumb down here and leave it separate. Now we've done extension, we've raised the head like this, and now it's time to begin to, to uh, learn some flexion, but again, nothing to do with piano playing. It's just, oh, how does this hand work? Now, would everybody please show me, how would you do this, this motion here? Would you please show me how you do this motion here? Okay, I can't see everybody, but, oh, you're a pretty good bunch. You're a pretty good bunch. But I see a few, somebody uh, in the middle over there, who's actually doing this. Okay? So they're at, I said, do this. And I didn't even say, most of you are doing a combination of a whole finger flexion and a flexion of a curling of the finger. So let's call this curving, as Dorothy Taubin does. And we'll call this curling. So some of you actually just curled. And as pianists, we tend to have this curling motion really, really down. And many of us lack the whole finger flexion altogether. It's unbelievable. Many of you had it and did it and, or com combined it with the, the curling and the curving, everything together. Fine. But we need to understand that there are two basic motions of the finger uh, uh, that that we need to master them both, and it's, uh, it's useful to separate them out in order to have that mastery clarified. So I like to give, especially to kids, they love this, you, you, you start talking about some monster in a swamp, and, yeah. oh my god, something's arising from the ooze, and oh my god, and, oh jeez, ah. And then, of course, but, you, you, but the, the best thing about this is that you only do it like, like a millimeter. For all you Americans, that's about a sixteenth of an inch. <laughs> all right. Let's see, let's, let's get a close-up of the monster. You see, just do it a tiny, tiny bit. Now, I, I talk a lot about the arch, especially in my first book and how the hand has to have this wonderful arch shape. And if you look at Rubinstein or many of the great pianists, their arch shape is wonderfully expressed. Uh, but people come to me and say, oh, my hand's too small. I can't really have that much of an arch. It's got nothing to do with the shape. Uh, many of these shapes that we're looking for, we get hooked on the shape when what we should be actually thinking about is what's the movement which generates the shape. So as soon as, and Moshe Feldenkrais even coined a word for that. He replaced the word posture with acture, as in the action which leads to a particular posture. So here, as soon as I've done this, you see, the monster, that, that's already enough. Because the, the action of the whole finger is the action of the lumbrical muscle, which is here, and the interosseous muscles, which are e on e either side of the hand, and they very gently do this. So when, when I, now look at how this works. I'll jump ahead a little bit out of the developmental series now and just show you. Uh, if I play a, 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 a note with just a flexion of the tip of the finger, what happens to that art? It, it actually collapses. And we see this all the time. We see many people playing like that. Well, why do they have tendonitis? Well, you're trying to walk using your ankle joint, your knee joint, and collapsing your hip joint. Mm -hmm. So that the hip joint is now demobilized. It's out of commission. It's just out of the picture altogether. And you are trying to walk or run or whatever. If you do the same move, that same key with a whole finger flexion, the arch immediately comes up. Because <coughs> this, so this motion, the whole finger flexion, is the arch generating motion. So, you know, I, the, my first book is now, it's now been out 11 years. It's out in the second edition, and it's, I've received a lot of feedback about it. But one thing is people obsess on this arch. Now they're going to have a healthy arch. And then somehow it gets into this rigid structure. 
It's got nothing to do about the rigid structure. It's got to do about an internal orientation, an internal action. And that's why I love this monster coming up out of the ooze. The primordial slime. And nobody, none of the kids, they've never heard of the day of the triffids. Uh, Triffid doesn't even look quite like this anyway. And I've never seen Jurassic Park, so... But anyway, we find a common ground about this monster, right? <coughs> so, now the, the next thing that the baby did was it started to roll. And this is a wonderful thing. So I can now modify my sliding to roll over onto my back and keep sliding and roll back onto the, the, the front. And by the way, when I roll, does the thumb stick up like that, like her head trying to look over there? Or does the thumb just stay, if the thumb stays relaxed, then the thumb will actually come under the hand. If I roll, the thumb comes to here. So you see already there's this beginning of a kind of a folding between the thumb and the hand, which is very similar to how that baby folded itself. I, well, I can't keep doing the, the camera like, like this. Fold the baby kind of, she turned sideways and she kind of folded herself to come, come up towards a sitting roll. So this, this is the equivalent in the hand. So you can do it on your, on your knee. So now we slide the hand this way, but bring the thumb under here. Uh, I'll, again, I'll jump ahead uh, about, about the thumb, uh, because in scales, do we pass the thumb under? So do we play a scale where the hand is swiveling like this? Or can we replace that with the thumb, yes, looking as if it's going to go under, but the thumb coming here. So on your knee, just bum, bum, and then bring not the thumb tip to the fingertip. This has been Carola Grindia loved this one, but I modify it to bring the lumbrical interosseous, the whole finger flexion, more into prominence and the reflection of the fingertip, give it a little, bit, a little bit of a break for a while. So it's thumb pad to finger pad, and then, then thumb pad to third finger pad, then thumb pad to fourth finger pad, ba -da -da you can do it on your knee, even to the fifth finger pad. And you see all the time we're cultivating this folding of the thumb under the hand which evolves out of rolling. Baby rolls, her feet, her legs fold in, her arms come around, and she's folded. So in this, in this scenario, the thumb is kind of like an arm, and the fingers are kind of like legs. So let's do a little bit more to, uh, to differentiate the thumb and the fingers. And for that, I'll actually, I'll actually show you why. How many people have, have seen somebody, you have to play... A, you have to play a chord like that, and then you see your student do it, and then what, how, well, how am I going to get to that thumb note? Well, the easiest thing to do is to drop this knuckle. Oh, look, and now my thumb can play its note. Let's do it up here. Uh, now drop that knuckle, and look, oh, it put the thumb right on the note. And my, the entire physical organization of my hand is completely screwed. <coughs> because, look, I have no hip joints, again. There's the hip joint. See, I sacrificed the hip joint in terms of economy of movement. This is a false economy because it's much more important to maintain the integrity of the standing function in the hand and then somehow bring the thumb over to its note. So you notice I am now in a position of ulnar deviation. Uh-oh, another no-no. However, to my mind, we need not to avoid ulnar deviation. To my mind, the structure of the hand necessitates it many, many times, and especially because we need to cultivate this, this independence of the thumb from the rest of the hand and get out of doing things like that. Now, I could, I could okay, I'm not going to ulnar deviate. I'm going to stay like this, and now, in order to get my thumb to its nose without dropping the arch, I have to do that. Now, this is actually very often seen with many, many good pianists. So if I do this kind of a, a, a position, and I'm not rigid in it, like I can still move in and out of it, this is also a, a, a possible solution. However, this folding of the thumb and this further rendering the thumb independent from the hand, 
and see how much mobility and flexibility there is in terms of functional mobility, functional flexibility between the hand and the thumb, which attaches directly to the arm, that if I'm cultivating this kind of the hand is one entity and the thumb is another entity, then I'm going to create more and more possibilities to actually do go into a, a, an ulnar deviation which does not hurt at all, but which actually feels really, really nice. <clears throat> so you can grab the thumb and then and clamp, use the fingers of the other hand, even clamp this, get this second, second knuckle here, uh, not this bottom joint here, but the second one here, it's the medial phalange metacarpal joint and <clears throat> grab all around it and really clamp and then in that kind of a situation begin to roll and fold the hand over the thumb and then unfold the hand and let the hand slide down and let the arm drop. <coughs> yeah. So you can stand on a straight thumb and curl the fingers and then uncurl the fingers and curl the fingers and uncurl the fingers. If I, if I bend the thumb like that, well, I'm a Canadian and hockey is our game and this is like ankle skating. And if you'll bend your thumb like that, then, then just sense what happens in your neck. Sense what happens in your neck and then straighten the thumb and sense what happens in your neck and in your shoulder and in your elbow and then bend the thumb again and see what sort of tensions are now engaged in order to maintain, to, to avoid complete collapse, maintain some semblance of standing. Then straighten the thumb again and feel oh, it all lets go. The scalene muscle lets go, the shoulder lets go, the elbow lets go. So in order, sometimes we have to hook in the thumb to get a certain interval or something, but many times if we can keep it straight like that, then we're going to actually feel the resulting relaxation radiate all the way up into our bodies. <clears throat> Another one you can do on your legs is just uh, stand on the fingers and then stand on the thumb and then stand on the fingers and then stand on the thumb. So <coughs> on, the, on the piano it might look like this. All of these you can do either on the piano or away from the piano. And then we can get into five note patterns, but holding all five notes, because we, we tend to play, a kid, when they do come to the piano and they haven't had this, this preparation, this long apprenticeship, then they tend to use their arm to help push the note down. They tend to play like that, because their fingers are really tiny and the key is really big, and well, I'd better do this to help. And then we spend all our time, well, try to play, make a, a smooth phrase, but they still want to do this. So, when I overhold all five notes, that renders this impossible. I, well, I can actually still do it, but now the arch is not being compromised. You see? This finger is still standing while this finger comes to stand. This finger is still standing while the next one comes to stand. So overholding, again, people say, don't overhold, it's going to bind up the hand. But can we learn to overhold in a way that doesn't bind the hand? If my arm is going like this and the whole hand structure is sliding on the five fingertips, there's not going to be much binding up. There's going to be a wonderful sense of all the skeletal structure working together to create a sense of harmony, a sense of stability in movability. And this is what's going to give my phrase its integrity. This is what's going to avoid the bumps that destroy a phrase shape. So I'm not going to play over holding all the time, but I do this as an exercise so that the hand can begin to sense itself and to sense what is its, is it its, what is its physical experience when there's absolutely no loss of structure through a small phrase group. <coughs> Going, I started with one, two, three, four, five because five, four, three, two, one is, is again more difficult because now, oh my God, we've got that thumb and the thumb is going to pull the hand down. No, the thumb when it plays can push the hand away from this, from it itself. See, so if I do this, if I move my thumb and now attach the thumb to the key, the same movement pushes the hand in the other direction. So we're noticing your students and perhaps even in yourself how. There's a tendency for this, this space to collapse and how it creates an anomaly of stresses, whereas these stresses are healthy stresses because they're structure building stresses. <clears throat> now, 
I've skipped over a lot. <coughs> I'd like to end with just a few things to relate all this back to the whole body. Um, would you please uh, again slide the hands down here and slide the hands back. But now, a lot of, sense what is happening in your pelvis. You've got two sits bones, they're sitting on the chair. You can feel the left and the right imprinted into the chair. So, some people might rock their pelvises back when they slide their hands down their leg. Some people might rock their pelvises forward. What do you do? But the whole idea is the sense that the whole body is playing the piano. Arnold Schultz in his book, The Riddle of the Pianist's Finger, wrote many wonderful things about legato and how wonderful and how necessary it is. But he said, he made one uh, phys physical mistake. He said that every fulcrum must have a stable base from which to move. And so, therefore, you fix the hip joints. The body is a, an interlocking series of levers, of fulcrums, and they all need to be movable if I want, again, to make peace with gravity. Because if, if, I'm, if I'm doing any movement, if I move my arm in isolation, then I've cut off my arm from my body. If my arm moves and there's a spiral twist down through the entire skeletal frame to the place where I'm, where I'm connected to gravity is, at the, is at, at the ground, at my feet. And there needs to be movement all the way through the frame to the point of contact with the ground, which is your point of contact with gravity. So here it's my sits bones. So again, uh, can I now stand my hand up into a nice strong arch and then pull, pull on my fingers, pull and see, oh my God, I pulled my entire pelvis forward. Could I push my pelvis away from myself, from myself, from my fingers? See, my fingers are myself. <laughs> <coughs> I am pianist. Yes. Um, what else was there? Oh, do, do, you can do all those with walking forward, one, two, three, five, four, three, two, one, and having the wrist come forward, and have it one, two, three, four, five, and having the wrist come back and down, and the pelvis following. So there's a skeletal chain, and when that skeletal chain is fully involved in playing the piano, it's not going to be this kind of wild weaving, oh, I am so expressive when I play the piano. No, it's, it's, and it's not going to be, uh, Rubinstein internalized it all. There's this wonderful, Paulina here, she showed at the, another conference this clip of Rubinstein playing the Liszt A-flat constellation, and he just sat. But you see, inside, this skeletal chain is manifesting, and you hear it in the sound. The sound is not trying to be expressive. He's inside the piano. He's not on the keys, he's in the keys. And, floating through from within one to within the next. And that's the physical process that creates a musically sinuous line rather than a line that's imposed from without. Uh, this is another thing that we, want, we talked about yesterday is can we de devise exercises and ways of developing our physical ability which match onto musical aesthetics rather than they're just two different realms. And now I did all this stuff and now I'm going to play. No, everything we do affects the sound. Every physical intervention is going to create a certain musical gesture, a certain musical character, a certain musical sonority. So can I use these kinds? And then now I'm not going to play with my palm constantly uh, in co touch with the keys. But uh, there's a little 12-minute interview with Daniel Trifonov on YouTube now, and he starts talking about two bars of Tchaikovsky Concerto. Uh, I, what is it? I, uh, I'm playing by ear. I, I should have really learned it. It's something like that. I'm totally by ear. Uh, and he plays it in ten different ways with ten different characters and ten different sonorities. And he says, oh, it could be intimate or it could be, you know, heroic. And, but you see his hands constantly caressing the keys and having such a rich contact with the key that it's, it's like it's the wisdom of the palm transmitting it through the fingers, which are basically a delivery system for the wisdom of the palm. And that's the baby on its belly. And all those babies, they have an internal conductor. They have 
Um, they're actually diaper dancers. <laughs> <laughs> and can we, by regaining an organic biological sense of connection to the keys, by regaining our heritage, which is not jumping over the first year of apprenticeship, but learning how to sense that not only is my hand joined in a more in intimate way to the piano, then my whole body is more joined in an intimate way to the piano, I can do the same movements I was always doing at the piano to play the notes, and yet there's a sense of sinuous moving connection. So even in even the shaping of, of a single phrase, I, I feel that the pie, the palm is there, the palm, and it's not even about the arm weight technique or the finger action school or the Russian pressure technique. Anton Rubinstein was asked, how do you play so great with such wonderful sonority? He said, press, press until your fingers bleed. <laughs> <laughs> and they found blood on the keyboard after some of his concerts, so he practiced what he preached. But he played great. Now, I'm going to go one minute over time. Because I'm supposed to finish now, but this is, the, this is the thing that ties it all together. There's a new concept out now in the field of biomechanics called biotensegrity. And yesterday I was listening to a, 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 a talk and I see this weird thing <laughs> in, the, in the pack sack of the guy in front of me. There's a guy named Doug. I forget your last name. Johnson. Johnson, yeah. Now this thing... Uh, resembles the human spine more than any static model. None of the, in some of these, none of the physical, the, the, none of the parts are actually touching. This is a tensegrity model. All, all the forces are transferred through the wires rather through, than through the solid parts. So here some of the solid parts touch, but they don't transmit forces. All the forces are transmitted by, by the wires. So Buckminster Fuller developed these things, and then a few years ago, a, a guy named Stephen Levin, a doctor, saw this, and he said, that's it, that's the model for the human spine, for the human body, because all these bricks stacked up seem so static, and it just doesn't seem to reflect the elegance and the sophistication and the movement ability. Here, it's the ligaments and the tendons and the muscles and the cartilage that are in, a, in maintaining this incredible body in a state of constant flux. So... The finger action school, when it's done badly, it, you lose the state of flux. You lose the, the sense of elasticity within the system. When finger action school is done well, you maintain that elasticity. When the arm weight school is done badly, you fall into a key and you lose that state of elasticity. Claudia Rao said, for arm weight technique, strong fingers are the sine qua non. What does that mean? means you, you bring some weight in, but the fingers are maintaining their elasticity, their, their, their ability to move within the system. Anton Rubinstein's pressure technique would seem to stiffen everything, and yet he was moving within it. So he was creating a structure and then bringing biotensegrity to that structure. So, and these exercises, again, evoke biotensegrity because they relieve the hand of stress and, and regain the hand's sense of its ability to move within itself. So I propose biomusico-pianistico-tensegrity as, <laughs> as a new concept to try and, and, in a practical way, bring the wisdom of all these different schools together and to create something new that goes further, that allows us to, our techniques to flower, and for us to finally be free from a lot of these problems, tendonitis and performance injury, uh, that we've been suffering with for so long. So, I do thank you for your patience and for coming. And <laughs>